Good afternoon. Um, so, as Eleanor said, I'm Emma Burns. I'm a PhD student here, um, and my research area is around the participation of people with intellectual disabilities in political and public life. But I'm speaking here today from my role as an activist and in the abortion rights campaign, specifically in Tipperary. Um, so, Tip for Choice is a rural grassroots group organised or established in 2014, and we were campaigning for access to abortion in Ireland. Tipperary has traditionally been one of the most conservative counties in the country, and we were very relieved that 59.1% of the voters uh, in our constituency went out almost exactly one year ago to support repeal of the Eighth Amendment. So, Susie was going to speak about the experiences of disabled people in the campaign. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'll quickly recap as well something that went, sort of things that went on during the repeal campaign and how it maybe influenced how disabled people were fr framed in the campaign. So disabled women and those with critical illnesses have always borne the brunt of restrictive abortion laws in Ireland. In 1983, Sheila Hodgers became pregnant while ill and she had her cancer treatment withheld, including x-rays and pain relief. She and her baby died. The X case and subsequent discussions often framed mental health as not real health and suicidality as a convenient method of escaping the consequences of female sexuality, even when the girls and women at the centre of these cases were survivors of abuse or rape. Women had to travel to the brink of death and in the case of Miss P, sometimes beyond death, before interventions would be offered. So these high profile cases have pushed public, public consciousness forward and ignited grassroots activists push for reform. For reform. They've predominantly concerned women and girls in precarious situations. There's been a threat to their physical or psychological well-being. They've been driven to psychological distress by the state. They've been migrant women, women of colour. They've received a diagnosis of fatal anomaly, live in confinement, their children. They've been subject to violence and rape. For the most part, these are not wealthy, middle-class Irish people. They are people without power or representation, people constrained by their status in society, by their circumstances. They're the people who fall through the cracks. So grassroots organisations emerged to fill the gaps left by ineffective political leaders and legislators who failed to promote human rights. There's long been resistance and protest in Ireland against restrictions on women's access to abortion, but it didn't really catch fire until the death of Savita Halepanover in Galway, here in Galway in 2012. So her story resounded with ordinary people. Video footage emerged of her dancing just a few weeks earlier. Um, it, she was young, she was vital, she was beautiful, she was happy to be pregnant, and then it all went wrong. She suffered an inevitable miscarriage she needed interventions, but because there was a fetal heartbeat, she received no aid. And she was told that this is because Ireland is a Catholic country and she died of sepsis. There was a feeling that what happened to her could have happened to any one of us. And people began to attend candlelit vigils for her. They began to talk and they began to organise. So it was around this time that the abortion rights campaign was formed. And as I said, other groups and individuals had been campaigning since 1983 when the Eighth Amendment was introduced to try and change the abortion ban. But ARC, the abortion rights campaign, appeared at a crucial moment. I know there's quite a few of you here who were involved with ARC or one of the other groups, so excuse me if I'm Emma explaining any of this to you. Um, so ARC really tapped into that anger and that shame and that momentum for change that existed. And it was a really critical moment. They reached out to all the small informal groups that were organising, the women who were having conversations online, and they offered facilitation and support. It was founded with an with explicitly intersectional framing of abortion rights. From their own mission statement, they said, ARC aspires to be inclusive and representative of the varied groups of people affected by Ireland's restrictive abortion laws. We believe this requires a particular focus on those groups that are disproportionately affected by these laws, including women who are marginalised by poverty, racism, immigration status and disability. At this time, most of their focus around disability was on accessibility in the campaign. So it was about having meetings in accessible spaces. It was about making documents accessible, making the march accessible. No doubt a lot of the members themselves were women with disabilities or people with disabilities, but you know, it was quite limited in how far it went around discussing disabled access to abortion. Outreach was happening, but it was slow. 
Then Susie Byrne spoke out in the national media that she felt both sides in the debate were abusing people with disabilities. So I know I have a slide on this. Yeah. So this is how it was framed. Of course, there always has to be conflict. There always has to be this both sides of the debate. But Susie lit a fire under us. It had to change. Um, ARC decided that they would try to move beyond tokenism. They wanted to start with co-authoring some myth-busting blog posts with disabled women to counter the ableist propaganda that was being used by the No campaign. A private Google group was set up. Women with disabilities were invited to come on board to liaise with ARC for the initial stages. We produced the blogs, which were grand, but they really didn't do enough to address the harmful discourse that was emerging around disability in the referendum campaign. Every mention of disability related to prenatal screening and children. Pro-choice spokespersons often displayed ignorance of the concerns of disabled women, or worse, revealed embedded ableism in their framing of disability rights in the abortion rights campaign. Disabled women were still invisible as sexual citizens with intimate and personal relationships. Disabled women, um, sorry, yeah, sorry, with families with the same potential to experience crisis pregnancies as non-disabled women. Disabled women as rights holders were largely missing from the debate. So the group that had come together to contribute to the ARC blogs, and again, some of these people are in the room, basically anyone who was active on social media and seemed to have a pro-choice outlook, was targeted and invited to join the group and harassed until they either took part or hid. Um, <laughs> Um, they decided to establish themselves as a distinct group, People with Disabilities for Repeal. This is parallel to Evie Nevin's establishment of Disabled People Together for Yes. So my own involvement with that ended with their decision not to join ARC, and they've since gone on to form Disabled Women Ireland and have plans to take over the world. Um, at the same time, there were collaborations between ARC and groups like Merge, the Migrant and Ethnic Minorities for Reproductive Justice, with TENI, the Organisation for Trans Rights, with the Sex Workers Alliance, all with the aim of bringing those on the margins into the campaign. Then the referendum was announced, and the three main groups, ARC, the National Women's Council, and the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment, combined forces to form together for YES, the National Campaign to Repeal the Eighth Amendment. So it's been suggested that this was a unified movement, a way for all the diverse groups to come together and combine efforts to secure abortion rights, and such success. Um, I'm sure that the history books will record, and we've seen it being recorded, that it was a seamless campaign that joined everyone together, brought communities together seamlessly to repeal the Eighth Amendment. It wasn't quite like that, as most of you know. So it switched from being a purely grassroots, homegrown, diverse feminist organisation with flat hierarchies and transparent decision-making processes to a slick, centrally directed, professionally run campaign with strict messaging and zero tolerance for deviation from the messaging book. I don't think we would have won the referendum without it, but it, I also recognise the damage that was done to marginalised groups by the disengagement from the collaborative efforts that had gone before that. So the first to go was trans-inclusive language. And I think uh, Sandra's going to touch on that, so I won't go into that one. Um, and then it seemed that women with disabilities, migrant and ethnic minority women, and trans men were largely excluded from spokesperson roles in high-profile events, especially in rural areas like where I lived. The faces of the campaign were white and Irish and able-bodied. They were concerned, polite, professional, each discussion panel that we ha held had to have a doctor, a lawyer, Ruth is here, she was on one of ours, um, someone whose pregnancy was affected by a fatal fetal abnormality. The professionals were incredibly good ad advocates and activists, but they weren't representative of the women who were named in that alphabet of oppression that went before. So for the most part, we didn't hear about the messier edges of the campaign, from the places where multiple oppressions occur to squeeze people out of their rights. There was no place in this campaign for the sex worker, the woman with a psychosocial disability, women of colour, disabled women, traveller women, trans men. They were sacrificed for the greater good. Some rebelled and we held breakaway events that we didn't tell headquarters about. But there was a silent agreement that we would hold our tongues until the campaign was over. Um, Maria has spoken in a piece called Our Aims Are Shared, in which she pinpointed the commonalities between the position of pregnant women and people with disabilities under Irish law. Pregnancy and disability are the two criteria which can remove a person's right to be the final decision maker in their own care. 
Pregnancy and disability can cause you to be treated without your consent. We didn't hear from people with psychosocial disabilities, despite their common experiences of forced treatment, removal of capacity, disregard for informed consent. People with intellectual disability do not have their bodily autonomy respected. Some are given contraceptive injections without informed consent. It was ruled last year that an Irish woman with an intellectual disability was to undergo a vasectomy against her will. These abuses are still occurring, haven't changed. So we learned on this campaign that collaboration and direct action is needed to create the pressure needed to push politicians into action. We've learned the importance of narratives of personal storytelling um, to opening people's minds to change. Those of us who campaigned by knocking on people's doors to ask for our rights learned that ordinary people, the ones who are not engaged in actions or politics, are not as conservative or uninformed as we might assume. So some of the things, again, that we would like to bring forward from the campaign, if I can find what I have, <laughs> is that we have to take what we learned. We have to pull apart the fears and concerns that we have in safe spaces where we can discuss ideas, where we can share the concerns that we see. We have to flesh out what are our biases, why do we hold them? And we have to be able to bring those forward in non-judgmental spaces and, and see where can we go Discussions with bioethicists tend to be set in the context of free access to abortion. We can never lose sight to the rights of women in the debates around disability and abortion. Disabled women's voices need to be heard. We need to prepare for the battles ahead. Grassroots organising, building alliances with other groups, ensuring that other advocacy groups and practitioners are educated about the specific concerns of disabled people. These are at the heart of where we need to go after repeal. Thank you.
um, I was I was just saying earlier that I'm literally standing at the corner of the party going, hey, pay attention to us, we want to talk to you. We don't even want to criticize your horrible, awful provision of abortion. We just want to make pathways for those people who are, who are having difficulty in accessing care. Um, so basically all of our clients, all abortion support network clients face obstacles. And the clients who face disability, who, who also are, my terminology is really horrible and I apologize. And if I say anything offensive, please just put your hand up and educate me. Um, but our clients who have disabilities face additional obstacles to our normal client obstacles, which can include anything raised, uh, ranging from poverty, uh, domestic abuse, um, medical professionals not, uh, not listening, uh, getting rooked in by crisis uh, by road crisis pregnancy centers. Um, poverty, though, is, is, is the really, really big one. And, and the other thing is, is uh, caring responsibilities, which uh, can be, uh, it can be, you can't leave because you have kids, and it can also be, it's harder for you to leave because you have caring responsibilities for somebody with a disability who, you know, in addition to the regular difficulty of finding somebody to take care of, you know, uh, getting help with caring responsibilities is hard enough. Getting help with caring responsibilities for somebody who has um, disabilities can be more difficult. Um, and a lot of people have, they have intersections of all those different obstacles and they just sort of pile up and they make what should be a five minute super safe medical procedure into what seems like an insurmountable ordeal. Um, so a lot of people, not I don't think any of the people in this room, but a lot of people after the referendum were like, oh, you guys can close now. It's gonna be, gonna be all sorted. Everybody who wants an abortion in Ireland is gonna be able to have one. Um, but that is, that is not the case. Um, first of all, there are gaps in care. Second of all, we've got this ridiculously medically unnecessary three-day wait period that means that you need, I think we've calculated between two and five trips to the doctor to get an abortion. Um, there's the fact that almost all the provision is an early medical abortion, which some people prefer, but in some cases, it could be argued that other forms of abortion, be it um, manual vacuum aspiration or surgical, would be uh, much less invasive. Um, and then also the fact that the, the, the time limit of 12 weeks is a disaster, um, given the numbers of birth control or fertility issues or just hormones or nature that mean that not all of us have regular menstrual periods. Um, and um, so we are still hearing from a number of people who need to travel for old, kinds of reasons. Um, so we're just basically still here. And I have learned so much about what more we can do to, to help, uh, in particular people with disabilities. And I would really, really, really like to hear anything that you all think that we should be doing. Um, we, you know, we're tiny, we don't have an office, we don't have <coughs> massive amount of budget, like, like most people here. Um, we're, we're very dependent on volunteers. However, we also really like to be flexible and we really like to sort of literally bend over backwards uh, for, for people who have extenuating circumstances, whether that be uh, funding for, addition, for additional people to travel with you, finding somebody who can travel with you, uh, finding creative caring responsibility solutions, um, extra funding for any, you know, we all know that if you need to travel, getting from point A to point B is not always so easy. Um, if you don't live in Dublin or Cork, uh, although the, the, the coach is, is lovely, I guess, but I actually didn't, I didn't notice, and, but we'll ask on the way back if, if the GO bus that I took here is accessible. No. Oh, great, yeah, so <laughs> right there, um, you know, so we have money, so we can fix the things that money can fix, but uh, it's, it's more about ensuring that organizations know that we're still here, we're going nowhere, and we really wanna fill, I mean, of course, the end goal would be for free, safe, legal, accessible in-country 
but while we wait for that day, we want to do the best that we, we can to help those who have to travel, travel. Um, yeah, and nothing we do is going to be perfect, but we really try never to let uh, excellence be the enemy of good. And good enough is something that we, there's a typo in the annual report, it's good enough. Um, you know, it's, we really are, are just doing the best that we can, and I'm just so, so pleased to be here and look forward to learning. Good afternoon. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, my name is Sandra Duffy and I'm a member of the steering committee of Laureates to Choice. And just before I start speaking, I just want to acknowledge the work of these two incredible women that are on the panel with me. Emma running her local group, Tipperary for Choice, being a huge and conservative county, and Mara and her team at Abortion Support, who are invaluable in providing reproductive justice access. Uh, for people both in Ireland, North and South, and now in Malta and Gibraltar as well. So it's, uh, it's a privilege to be speaking alongside you. So just uh, if you don't know us, Lawyers to Choice is um, a pro-choice feminist uh, organisation made up of both academic and practitioner lawyers and also some law students. Um, we are an intersectional feminist group. Uh, we try to make everything we do as inclusive as possible. Um, again, perfect not being the enemy of the good, um, but just putting that uh, front and centre. Um, so I want to talk about just a few problems uh, that have come up in the legislation that are particularly um, difficult, I suppose, when it comes to disabled people and abortion access. Uh, I also want to note that there will be a review of this law um, in a couple of years' time, so we need to keep that perspective in mind also. So the uh, legislation which uh, governs abortion access in Ireland is called the Health Regulation of Termination of Pregnancy Bill 2018. And I'm, just, I'm going to cite some of the sections as I go along, um, but I won't go into chapter and verse on it. The first thing I want to note just before I start uh, addressing anything in particular is that the bill uses particularly exclusionary terminology, so it refers at all times to pregnant women as opposed to pregnant people, so it doesn't take into account trans and non-binary people who also require reproductive justice access. It defines a woman as a female person of any age, which again is quite problematic. Um, so as I speak, I'll be using the term pregnant person. I don't mean that to erase women, I just want to uh, take into account the fact that women are not the only ones accessing these services. So there are three major problems uh, with the legislation as it stands that I want to highlight today. And they are the criminalization uh, which still exists in the Act, the problems of access um, as they're set out in the legislation, and also just some of the problems around uh, medical specialists and the need for review um, and, and the sort of bureaucracy side of it. So first of all, the criminalization element that still stands in the bill or the act, sorry, force of habit. Um, it's, it, it's kind of unbelievable to think that we're actually standing here discussing this as a law that, that's in effect. Um, this time last year it would have been lovely to know that. Uh, <laughs> so section 23 of the act anyway, um, it provides that it's an offence for anyone to intentionally end the life of, of a fetus other than in conditions in accordance with the act. So what that means is that only a medical practitioner, um, as defined in the Act, is allowed to perform an abortion for someone. And if they do so outside the terms um, that are given to them, that it's a criminal offence. It's also a criminal offence to prescribe, administer, supply, or procure any drug or instrument or apparatus which could be used to perform an abortion. Um, it's an offence to aid, abet, counsel, or procure um, a pregnant person to access an abortion outside the terms of the Act. This doesn't apply to the pregnant person themselves, but it does, it does apply to anyone um, who might be a, a friend, a relative, a caregiver, another medical practitioner, anybody who a pregnant person could turn to if they require assistance accessing abortion services. 
and there's a pretty low penalty of 14 years um, for that. So it's still very restrictive, it's still quite a chilling effect. Um, and when we're talking about a uh, disabled person with any kind uh, of impairment, whether that be a mobility impairment who might need help to, act, to physically access resources, whether that be um, someone who is suffering from mental ill health and is finding it difficult to be able to, act, to access resources or to go through uh, going to the doctor, whether that be someone who's underage, who's experienced sexual abuse, um, that there is still that barrier there, that criminalisation in the Act. Um, so that in itself uh, is a problem. So, but even if you can get access, um, that, uh, then again, the, the Act also does um, limit that too. So it's been referenced already that there is um, a three-day waiting period for someone who wants to, uh, to access abortion services. So under section eight, uh, sorry, under section twelve of the Act, if a pregnant person goes to their GP and requests uh, an abortion during the first twelve weeks of pregnancy, they must wait three days from the first consultation to actually access the abortion itself. Um, what this means is that you have uh, two medically unnecessary trips to the doctor, which again, for people who are finding access an issue or finding getting to the doctor an issue. Um, again, impairs their access to care. Um, it also dates from, um, as Mara mentioned, the 12 weeks from the start of the last monthly period, which again, for anyone with uh, conditions that causes uh, irregular menstrual periods, um, is a problem because the dating could be inaccurate and it's uh, unfortunately the case that that could push somebody over the 12 week limit um, not, and therefore uh, not allow them access care. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to highlight just in the Act itself um, is the language around specialists. So the language uh, given is that when a medical practitioner needs to certify the risk to a pregnant person, um, to their health or to their life, which might qualify them to access an abortion, the medical practitioner has to be someone appropriate to the care or treatment of the woman in respect of the risk. So again, when you're talking about someone with a disability or with a chronic condition, um, you're talking about possibly a very limited pool of doctors here in Ireland. Certainly if you're living outside the cities, it could be problematic to have uh, an extra specialist come in to, uh, to help certify. The second problem that complicates that then comes when you have to access the review system. So if your doctor turns you down for abortion access, you can apply to a review panel. The review panel also has to include a specialist appropriate to the care or treatment of you with respect to the risk that you are claiming. But uh, they are disqualified from attending that review panel if they've previously been consulted by the patient about this issue. So if you attend the specialist, if you've already talked to your specialist, about the fact that you need to terminate a pregnancy, uh, it ends up that that person is actually disqualified from being on your review panel, um, if necessary, too. So again, that's quite a problem in a country like Ireland where uh, the medical system is quite small and specialists in, in sort of niche areas in it are quite limited. Um, so those are kind of the problems uh, as they stand. What I just wanted to finish up by talking about was the need to keep a disability perspective in mind as we work forward through the implementation of this law and as we come to the review of the law also. Um, the problems that I've cited, sorry, excuse me, the problems that I've cited are um, very evident and I think they're going to come uh, up a lot more as we, uh, as we work towards implementation and as we get uh, more reports of cases coming out. But in order to be inclusive, in order to create a law, a legal system, um, and sort of generating from that also a policy system that is inclusive of everybody, we need to keep in mind these things while we review. We need to keep in mind physical access to doctors and specialists. We need to keep in mind um, proper consent policies and proper um, taking into account uh, differences in capacity, differences um, in both legal 
the strict legal definition of capacity to consent, but also capacity to access, capacity to, uh, to advocate for oneself um, when it comes to abortion access. We need to keep in mind that there are different forms of disability um, and that these things, these things affect people uh, in different ways. We need to keep in mind that there are, as Mara said, going to be people who fall through the cracks um, and that our job, I suppose, as lawyers and um, as policymakers, both in reproductive justice and in disability law, um, as many of you are, is to <coughs> advocate for ourselves and for our communities um, in order to make uh, any reviewed law or any reviewed policy implemented um, as inclusive as we possibly can have it. Um, so I will leave it there. And kind of a, a very quick little stop tour of, of, of those, uh, but delighted to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Thanks to all of our speakers for again a very stimulating discussion, and I'll open it up to the floor now for questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. So